welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Richard Albert, William Stamps Ferris Professor in Law and Professor of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. We will discuss his new book, Constitutional Amendments, Making, Breaking, and Changing Constitutions, which is published by Oxford University Press. So welcome to the show, Richard. Hey, Brian. It's such a joy to be with you. Thank you for your invitation. No, the pleasure's all mine. Um, This is a great and really kind of thought-provoking book about constitutional theory. Um, But I was wondering if maybe for listeners who aren't as familiar with constitutional theory, you could start by talking a little bit about what a constitutional amendment is and why you think that uh, understanding the amendment process is important to understanding how constitutions work. I think that's a great place to start, Brian. Every country has its own constitution, whether it's a codified constitution like we have in the United States or whether it's an uncodified constitution, disaggregated constitution like you have in New Zealand or the United Kingdom, for example. And whether you have a codified constitution or an uncodified one, there are rules for how you make changes to that constitution. And it's important to have a way to change a constitution because you want to keep the constitution current and you want to keep it reflective of present preferences and needs. And so that is where the amendment rule comes in. It allows us to change the constitution, to keep current, to um, perhaps um, uh, if there's a problem with the constitution, if there's an error that we notice, if the constitution doesn't work the way we expected it to work, the amendment rule is there to engage, to deploy, to fix that problem, to update the constitution. Mm. Well, so how do countries go about amending constitutions? I mean, is there only one way to do it, or are there multiple ways in which a constitution might be changed? The standard way of designing a constitution was um, uh, was actually, uh, uh, I think, the first major amendment rule we see in the Articles of Confederation. And that's the standard design of amendment, where you have one way to amend every single thing in the Constitution. So one comprehensive rule. Today, the design has really become more complicated. So if you look around the world to constitutions designed, let's say since 1989, 1990, thereabouts, um, you're more likely to see what I've described as an escalating structure of constitutional amendment, which is to say that there are different procedures for amending different parts of the Constitution, where one procedure applies to a certain part or principle or rule in the Constitution. Another applies to a wholly different set of rules, principles, parts of the Constitution. And the rules differ in how hard they are to use, and they differ according to the importance of the thing that we must amend using that particular rule. So for example, in the Constitution of Canada, there are five different ways to amend the Constitution, but each of those ways can be used to amend different parts of that Constitution. The most difficult rule to amend the Constitution requires unanimous agreement among all political actors across the federalist structure of government. That applies to the most important things in the Constitution of Canada. So, of course, we want to make it harder to amend the things that are most important and easier to amend the things that are least important. Mm. Well, so in your book, you talk about different kinds of constitutional amendments as well, and actually provide kind of a taxonomy of different ways in which a constitution might be amended. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that taxonomy and how different kinds of amendments might do different kinds of things. There are two big categories of change that I identify in the book. The first is amendment. And the second is dismemberment. So we have a distinction here between amendment and dismemberment. The the important distinction between the two is that an amendment, as I define it, keeps the Constitution coherent. So after the change to the Constitution, after it has been amended, 
that post-amendment constitution coheres with the pre-amendment constitution. The structure remains the same. The identity of the constitution remains the same. There isn't really much that changes other than this fix to the constitution, which isn't a dramatic change to it. A dismemberment, however, as I discuss in the book, is a transformative change to the Constitution, a transformative change that does one of three things. One, it changes the structure, framework of the Constitution. Two, it changes or transforms the rights that are protected in the Constitution. And or three, it transforms the identity of the Constitution. This is a dramatic transformation of the Constitution that we see political actors around the world try to do using the rules of simple amendment. This to me is a problem, a big problem because what we would like to do in the design of a constitution is to require political actors to assemble a greater degree of legislative or popular agreement to big changes like a dismemberment. And we don't want to impose upon them the same burden of assembling the same onerous supermajorities of the people and legislators when you need to simply amend the constitution to tweak it when there is a need to change the constitution to allow it to work the way we want it to work. So here's just an example, Brian, just to illustrate the point, because I've been speaking in generalities and concepts. Let me really bring it down to um, details so we can make sense of this distinction between amendment and dismemberment. The 12th Amendment to the United States Constitution is properly called an amendment. Why? Well, when the Constitution was written, there was an electoral college, as there still exists today, but the electors um, voted twice for president. And so you'd go in and you'd say, okay, I want person A to be president, and I also want person B to be president. And these votes would be aggregated across all members of the Electoral College, such that the person who scored the most votes for president would become president, and the person who scored the second most votes for president would become vice president. Now, you can imagine the problem that eventually happened, which was that there was a tie. And so the 12th Amendment comes along, which requires the electors to still cast two votes. But this time, they're differentiated votes, one for president and a second for vice president, diminishing the possibility of a tie. No, that is an amendment. You see, it's a correction. It's a fix to a problem that time exposed. And so the Article 5 process for amending the U.S. Constitution was deployed to fix this problem. Nothing dramatic changes about the Constitution. It remains the same Constitution. That is an amendment properly defined. Now, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, as they're called, to the United States Constitution come much later than the 12th. And they do something more dramatic to the Constitution than the 12th Amendment does. What do they do? Well, they reconstruct the U.S. Constitution. They together abolish slavery. They codify a promise of equality and due process. And they guarantee the right to vote without regard to race. Now, this is a transformation of the Constitution. Even though we can look at the U.S. Constitution, we can point to these changes as the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. They are not amendments. They are more than amendments. They are constitutional dismemberments that change the form, the function, the face of the U.S. Constitution. It's a reconstruction of the Constitution, reconstruction of the entire constitutional order. The Constitution after the Reconstruction is unrecognizable, unrecognizable to those who were looking at it before those changes came to be. And so that is the core of the distinction between amendment and dismemberment.
Mm. Well, so Richard, in, in light of what you just said, I mean, there was one example that you gave in the book that I found really powerful and moving, which was the two 13th Amendments. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that kind of example and why you think it's a helpful way of understanding this distinction. Well, thanks for raising that that uh, that distinction, because I think that is a critical distinction to help us understand the difference between an amendment and a dismemberment. The 13th Amendment, as we know it today, abolishes slavery. But that was not that was not supposed to be the 13th Amendment. Because the original 13th Amendment, that by the way is still ratifiable, some say, the original 13th Amendment would have made slavery a permanent feature of the U.S. Constitution. So rewind to 1860, 1861. A proposal is made to amend the Constitution. And this amendment would give states the right to control their, quote, internal affairs without intrusion from Congress. Now, internal affairs was code for slavery. If states wanted to use the machinery of law to make slavery lawful, then they could do so, and they'd be assured that Congress would not interfere. Moreover, that amendment, when proposed in 1860, 1861, was proposed to be an unamendable feature of the U.S. Constitution, unamendable for all times under that Constitution. So it was proposed in the Congress. It was approved by two-thirds of each house of the Congress. Then it goes to the states. Maryland ratifies, Illinois ratifies, Ohio ratifies. There's a presidential election happening at that time. Abraham Lincoln campaigns on the ratification of the Corwin Amendment, giving states the unamendable right to engage in the practice of slavery. Lincoln gets elected. In his first inaugural, again, he trumpets the Corwin Amendment as a necessary feature to the survival of the Union, because that was the purpose of the amendment. It was a way to find a, a, a way to keep the Union together, to prevent the southern slaveholding states from seceding. And so Lincoln sees the benefit behind uh, this amendment and says, this is going to keep the Union together, so I'm going to fight for it. But then the Civil War breaks out. Ratification stops. Battle begins. And then in the beautiful movie, Lincoln, uh, by Spielberg, you see how history changes because Lincoln then goes uh, on a different path, seeking to amend the Constitution, as I would say, dismember the Constitution, to abolish slavery. And in fact, he ends up doing that. So the original 13th Amendment would have been the opposite of the amendment that we now have as the 13th. American history is just so delicious that way uh, in the twists that it presents. But your question was, how does this help us understand, Brian, the distinction between amendment and dismemberment? The original 13th Amendment would have been a simple amendment to the Constitution. It would not have been a big change to the Constitution. Why? Well, because the original Constitution has infrastructure of slavery built into it. The Three-Fifths Clause, the Fugitive Slave Clause, the Deportation and Migration Clause. All of these are essential, indispensable, indispensable features of the U.S. Constitution that form part of its architectural core. And so the Corwin Amendment, had it been ratified, would not have been a big departure from the U.S. Constitution. But the 13th Amendment the one that is ultimately ratified is a dramatic departure. It transforms the U.S. Constitution into something that it was not. That is the dismemberment to the U.S. Constitution. Yeah, I mean, I love that distinction. I found it really deeply powerful. Um, and one of the other things I really liked about your book was the extent of comparative constitutionalism you engage in, especially because I'll, I'll confess, I really know very little about the constitutional order of countries other than the United States. Um, and, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, are different kinds of constitutions harder or easier 
to amend, what makes them harder or easier to amend, and sort of like how would we know? I devote a couple of chapters to these questions that you raise, Brian, uh, about how hard it is to amend a given constitution relative to another. And so there's a whole industry uh, in my field of comparative constitutionalism uh, that has emerged, let's say, since the 1980s or thereabouts, which has now become one of the favorite parlor games that people in my field play when we gather at conferences. So we ask the question, which is the world's most difficult constitution to amend? And sometimes um, people are fighting for their own country, either to have that distinction of the most difficult to amend or not to have that distinction. And so it's actually quite funny. But the problem with this parlor game, uh, when we bring it into the world of scientific research, uh, is that in my view, it's virtually impossible to determine which constitution out there is the world's most difficult to amend. And I say this despite there being dozens of studies that try to answer that very question, sophisticated modeling um, by economic, uh, in, in economics, sophisticated studies uh, trying to figure out which country has the most difficult constitution in the world to amend. And I try to show look, that it's impossible to do that. Here's why. Studies that seek to figure out relative amendment difficulty, they begin and end with the text of the Constitution. So they'll look to Article 5 of the U.S. and all of its existing counterparts in the world's constitutions. And they will quantify the difficulty of amending that particular Constitution based only on what the text of the amendment rule says. So, for example, the U.S. says... You need two-thirds approval in both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the states to ratify in order to create a valid amendment. So that sounds difficult, and it is difficult today, very difficult, maybe in fact impossible today to get three-quarters of the states and two-thirds of both houses of Congress to agree on an amendment to the Constitution. You see how few laws pass these days. Imagine trying to get that kind of supermajority across country. So today is virtually impossible, but but the same procedure, mm. Brian, two-thirds in the Congress, three-quarters of the states, the same procedure has existed across all of American history under the U.S. Constitution. And yet, and yet, in the 19-teens, there were four amendments passed in a decade. And so at the time, it was so easy to amend the U.S. Constitution that people, in fact, proposed amendments to make it harder to change the Constitution, to amend, to amend Article 5. And so Article 5 has not changed since 1787 when it was designed. And yet, you see, we have this variable difficulty in deploying it. And that's a function of the different configurations of political power in the country, certainly in the Congress, but also in the, country, in the different state capitals. And so this is something that <clears throat> scholars who study relative amendment difficulty cannot capture simply by reading the text of a constitution. So that's one thing that they miss. Another thing that they miss by looking simply at the text is that sometimes the rules of amendment themselves change, but without an accompanying writing to the new constitution. So what I mean by that is, Article 5, for example, it's possible that its counterparts around the world are interpreted by courts in a way that makes it harder or easier to use. It's possible that statutes are passed in Congress or parliaments around the world that make it easier or harder to use that rule, either by making it more permissive or by layering on top of the existing amendment rule additional barriers that must be crossed to make an amendment to the Constitution. And so these features of amendment rules around the world are not captured in the original Constitution. And so they cannot be quantified by scholars who look simply at the text of the amendment rule and try to then figure out which Constitution relative to the others, is the most difficult to amend. So these are some of the reasons why, Brian, I, I argue in the book that 
it's virtually impossible to accurately, reliably measure relative amendment difficulty. It's a fun game to play, but uh, you're not going to get any true scientific work out of it. Mm. Well, so one of the fascinating things for me about the quote unquote original 13th Amendment that that you discussed in the book was the fact that it purported to be an unamendable amendment. And, and I, I can't help but wonder, it's like, is it possible for a constitutional amendment to be unamendable or for an element of a constitutional amendment to be unamendable? I mean, are there elements of the existing U.S. Constitution or other constitutions that purport to be unamendable? And can that like actually work in practice? This is one of the most fascinating questions, Brian, in my entire field. And so it's, it's a delicious question. It's a fascinating question. And it's one that I spent a lot of time thinking about. There are many constitutions around the world today and historically that makes certain elements in the Constitution unamendable, meaning not lawfully changeable under that existing constitutional order. It's just impossible to do so legally. Now, it's of course possible to amend an unamendable rule in the Constitution, um, but you'd be violating the basic law of that Constitution. So we'd have to say something about what happens when you amend an unamendable rule? You'd have to say something like there's a legal revolution, or you might say that it's a dismemberment, or you might have to treat the post-amendment constitution as a new constitution. So we'd have to get into some, some arguments, some debate about how exactly to define that uh, happening. But there are many constitutions that make certain things unamendable. The German basic law, which is treated as a constitution, makes human dignity unamendable. The Turkish constitution makes the secular character of the state unamendable. The French constitution makes republicanism unamendable. There are reasons why these countries have chosen these particular features. Germany is a, is a response to the horrors of Nazism. The uh, French constitution's uh, unamendable rule on republicanism is a response to monarchy. No more. Never again will we revert to being a monarchy. Now, there is an unamendable rule in the U.S. Constitution, and it's one that is um, very little, um, very few people know about it because it's not presented in the Constitution as unamendable. We use in the Constitution's Article 5, we use obscure language about the rule, so that it's not clear that it is, in fact, unamendable, but in fact, it is. And every unamendable rule in every constitution that has one tells you something about the soul of that constitution, the very soul of the constitution. We know something about the soul of the German basic law when it tells us that human dignity is unamendable. We know something about the soul of the French constitution when it says that republicanism is unamendable. Well, the U.S. Constitution's Article 5 tells us that something is unamendable from the founding until the year 1808. And that tells us something about the soul of the American Constitution. You know what it is? The unamendable rule in the U.S. Constitution is the slave trade. The slave trade shall be unamendable for the first 20 years of the U.S. Constitution. That tells you something about the bargain that the framers entered into, mm -hmm. about the compromise that they entered into, about their bargain with evil that forms a very foundation of the U.S. Constitution. And so this is America's uh, only unamendable rule in the U.S. Constitution today. Now, there is a different kind of a rule that is unamendable, but it's unamendable only because it's impossible to imagine today the required supermajorities agreeing to change this particular rule, and that is the equal suffrage clause. People co incorrectly say that this rule is unamendable in the same way that the human dignity provision in Germany is unamendable or that republicanism is unamendable in France, but it's not the same thing. Here's why. The equal suffrage clause in the U.S. Constitution's Article 5 says you can amend the Constitution 
however you like, using the procedure requiring two-thirds of Congress and three-quarters of the states to agree. Parenthetical, by the way, Brian, there's another way to amend the U.S. Constitution through a convention. I'm not talking about that now because we've never used it. So just set that aside for now. Mm -hmm. Article 5 says, here's how you amend the Constitution, two-thirds of Congress, three-quarters of the states. You can use that to amend anything in the Constitution. But, but if you want to change the Equal Suffrage Clause, which requires each state to have two senators, then you must get the consent of the state whose representation in the Senate will be changed. Now, imagine you go to R Rhode Island and you say, Rhode Island, we want to take away a senator uh, from you. Uh, do you. Do you agree? Of course, Rhode Island is not going to give his consent. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> but I call this an example of constructive unamendability, constructive unamendability, because it's not unamendable by its substantive design. It's not saying you can never touch human dignity. It's saying you can amend it. You can take a senator away from California. You just need California to agree. But that's not ever going to happen. So it's practically unamendable, constructively unamendable. So these are two unamendable features in the U.S. Constitution, the only two. Well, I, I think this is incredibly profound, this observation of kind of what unamendability or the unamendability of a constitutional provision tells us about the kind of fundamental soul of the constitution in question. Uh, I, I can't help but wonder while reading your book whether there isn't also something about the nature of the amendment process in relation to a particular constitution that also tells us something fundamental about the nature of that particular constitution as well. You're quite right. So you have put your finger, Brian, on the most important takeaway from the book, which is that there is no more important part to any constitution than the amendment rule itself, because it is in the very amendment rule that we see what the constitution is all about. What does the amendment rule protect? What does it make unamendable? It tells us a lot about the constitution and what the writers of the constitution intended to do when they wrote the thing. So the Constitution of Cuba makes socialism unamendable. That tells you something about the place, about the people, about how they want to define themselves. Even where an amendment rule chooses not to make something unamendable, we can learn a lot about that Constitution. So for example, where nothing is unamendable, and where it's easy to amend the constitution in that particular jurisdiction, let's say by simple parliamentary majority. Well, that tells us something about the constitution. It tells us that what matters is the present popular uh, will as expressed through parliament. That what matters is what the people and their representatives believe today, not yesterday, not tomorrow, what they believe today. So that today the people rule here, the people Govern. That tells us something about the foundational principle of popular sovereignty as expressed in that constitution's amendment rule. So whether or not an amendment procedure makes something unamendable, we can learn a lot about the constitution by the design of that amendment rule. So for example, South Africa has an escalating structure of constitutional amendment, three rules, each one harder than the next each one applicable to different parts of the Constitution. From that design, we can tell what the writers of the Constitution and the people who supported the writing and ratification, what they view as most important in the jurisdiction. How? Well, because you just look to the things that are amendable by the hardest of the three rules. Well, so Richard, in, in closing, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on sort of practical takeaways about constitutions and constitutional amendments. In other words, I'm thinking like, in your, to your mind, should amending the constitution be easy or hard? Or is that just like a, an overly simplistic way of thinking about the problem? I don't think it's simplistic at all. I think it's a, it's a profound question um, that we should be thinking about when designing constitutions. What do we want our constitution to be like? Do we want it to be uh, hard to amend? And why? Do we want it to be easy to amend? And why? So there are some practical takeaways from study of constitutional amendment. When I'm asked 
by um, countries around the world to suggest ideas for amendment design, for constitutional design. I don't give them uh, a one size fits all answer. That I think is, that is malpractice. Um, that is just not a good way to go about advising people about what with their constitution. It's a very peculiar uh, answer, peculiar to that jurisdiction, specific to that jurisdiction. And so I think the important takeaways from the study of constitutional amendment rules, one is there's no one size fits all answer for all constitutions. Two, if there's uh, if you're asked to, to, to advise someone, to consult with someone about designing or redesigning their constitution, you need to know a lot about the place and the people and their history. Um, and then three, the more particular takeaway, and here I want to come back to the amendment dismemberment design. So give you one concrete takeaway uh, about how we can apply this idea to constitutional design is it's important, I think, in a constitution to occupy the field of change, by which I mean you want to cover all forms of change in your amendment rule. There are some constitutions out there that I think are very well designed. So they have a number of different amendment procedures, some of which cover what I have called in the book amendments, changes that keep the constitution coherent, and others that cover the field of dismemberment. So changes that allow you to transform the constitution into something that it is not. So for example, the constitution of Switzerland or Spain or Costa Rica, just as an example, they provide for uh, provisions that allow you to remake the constitution altogether, not simply to amend it, not simply to tinker with it, but actually to remake it. They call this a total revision or total replacement as opposed to a partial revision, which is an amendment, or partial replacement, also uh, uh, an amendment. And so I think it's important that constitutional designers be aware that it's possible to codify procedures, not just for simple tinkering amendments to the constitution, but also for wholesale constitutional renewal. Now, my interest in the book and when I'm asked to give advice to countries about amending their constitution and designing their constitution, my interest is legal continuity and predictability and stability all consistent with the democratic values of the rule of law. We want to follow rules. And so we have to write down what the rules are. And it's important, I think, to have rules that allow you not only to amend, but also to transform the Constitution so that there are no power plays, so that the incumbents can't try to write a new Constitution while using the rules of amendment. That is to say, so that they cannot write a new constitution that masquerades as an amendment. If you want to make a big change to a constitution, get more popular legislative support for it to reflect the proper approbation of the people and the representatives. So that, Brian, is one very specific application of one of the big ideas in the book to a present reality. Well, Richard, I want to thank you so much for making the time to come on the show today. I really enjoyed reading your book and have enjoyed immensely talking to you about it. Brian, I want to thank you. You provide such a great and fun service to the community of scholars by helping us to keep track of new books uh, and also to, to, to really you serve as a translator, I think, of big ideas into ways that are accessible your conversational, um, easy manner uh, in an interview setting like this. I've listened to all of your others. It's really a gift uh, to us and to the entire field of, 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 uh, of law. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, uh, Richard, I, I, that really makes me feel very proud. Thank you so much.
Should know.